road without end. Amen.
It is signed by us and witnessed by the congregation of the church. There will be a photo booth for the couples okay, there outside. You know? So after the service, you can go there and post. Uh, of course, our uh, members of our media team are happy and glad to serve you okay, for free, of course. And we can post that in our Facebook account and in our website so that the rest of the world can see that uh, you are renewing your your marriage now today. SOD class will start uh, next week already. And so please, uh, there is also a table provided for you to sign up and enroll. Again, on that side, those of you who will be uh, joining the School of Discipleship, we are offering three classes this, or four rather, okay? The regular schedule, we have the Monday that's for the Crucible. It's just a short course. Uh, and then on Tuesday, 7 in the evening, we have Theology Proper, Trinitarianism, the Doctrine of God. And then Thursday, at 7 in the evening, we will be offering Ecclesiology and Eschatology, or the Church and Last Days. Now, this is very important, especially if you are a leader of the church or you are a potential leader, because these are the basics of our faith. So please, we invite you to join the School of Discipleship. And then membership class will also be starting on July 13th. Those of you coming from other churches, or maybe you are uh, you have been worshiping with us, but you are just a worshiper, not a formal member of BCI. This class is for you. So this class will explain to you some of the important doctrines and practices that we have here at Bradford Church. Again, those of you who wish to become formal members of our church, please attend our membership class, which will start on July 13th, and that will be at 9 in the morning. And then those of you who want to be part of a Bible study group, a B group, we also have a table there so that you can sign up and then there is an insert in your program your bulletin membership and the pastoral care and service ministry so this is for the blood typing also this will serve as an update probably you change your phone number or cell phone number or your address please fill this up and give this to the ushers on your way out and then uh, finally, there is a, an invitation for our church to sing in a, there is a crusade coming, Dr. John Hong crusade, uh, this is coming July 24. And we are going to sing as a 100 voice choir. Okay, this is uh, among the evangelical churches here. Uh, spearheaded by uh, Simple Gospel Church. They are inviting us. And so, please, those of you who are members who are not joining regularly, okay, this is another opportunity for us to be part of the bigger body of Christ. So please start joining the choir. They are asking us to sing three hymns, um, How Great Thou Art, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, and one contemporary song, How Great Is Our God. So again, uh, you don't have to be an excellent singer to be part of this. Uh, we need you. Okay? Our church is invited to sing for this big gathering here in Cebu. But for the rest of the announcements, make sure that you bring home a copy of our weekly bulletin. Let's watch this uh, video announcement. They love their smartphones. In fact, they stay connected to everything that's important via their mobile device, except for church. And that's seriously important. What's up with that? You can stay connected to everything that's important at your church. See news, events, prayer requests, friends, and more. 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing in water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. May God bless the reading from his holy word. Please take your seats. Let us pray. Gracious God, our loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for another week ahead of us. Thank you for bringing us here to your house so that we can worship you, we can honor you, we can give you the glory that you deserve. Lord, we know that none of us is worthy of your presence, Lord, this morning. We acknowledge that we are sinners. We acknowledge that we have fallen short from your standards. There are things that we should have done, but we never did. Things that we were not supposed to do, but somehow we keep on doing. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us that we have fallen short from your glory. And we want to receive, Lord, your forgiveness and your mercy this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you promised that if people come to you with contrite hearts, with humble hearts, and with repentant hearts, you will forgive. Father, bless our emphasis today. We are going to talk about marriage. This is the institution, Lord God, that you have created you have planned it, but somehow society today has perverted it. And so Lord, help us to understand the, the origin, the importance, Lord God, of biblical marriage. Help us, Lord, to pursue it. Help us, Lord, to preserve it. Lord, I pray for all the married couples who are here that you will open their hearts and minds to truly receive your word, instructions, the lessons. And even, Lord, this message is also in preparation to those who are still planning to get married. We pray for them, O God, as well. Lord, we pray for our church. You bless all the ministries and programs lined up for next month. We pray, Father, for the school of discipleship, the membership class. We are praying for the B Group Leaders Fellowship. We are praying for the Christian Education Sunday. We are praying also for the different activities of the organizations, Lord, from the youth to the senior citizen. We ask, Lord God, for your guidance and your wisdom upon this. Um, events of our church, Lord. We pray, Father, for your permission as well. Lord, we, we are also committing to you the, the greater mission of BUCI, of planting 20 new churches of that. Lord, help us focus on your direction. We pray, Father, that you will bless those uh, church planting activities that we have today. Even uh, our mission pastor and others are in our outreach areas to conduct trainings 
so that our daughter and outreach churches, Lord, will grow, will be effective, Lord God, in their ministries. And so we are praying for them as well. Praying for all the pastors and workers, that you will give them, Lord, the filling and the empowerment of your Holy Spirit so that they can continue to do the past, Lord God. And now we pray for our nation. We pray for the Philippines. We pray, Father, for the issues and the concerns of the Philippines today. Guide our president that he will have, Lord, the guidance and wisdom that comes from you. Lord, we pray for peace and order. And we pray, Father, for the spiritual revival of the Philippines. All these things we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm 
You believe that? Nothing, nothing can conceive what? A spirit filled marriage. And that's our lesson this morning. The spirit filled marriage. This is part five of our series. We've been talking about the spirit filled life. Last week we talked about the spirit filled woman. Previously, we talked about the spirit-filled fathers or men. Now, we make it into an institution, it's marriage, right? But we we'll start with how the world today perceives marriage. How modern day has changed a lot of our ceremonies. Do you promise to love and to cherish each other both online and offline? So that's how they do it now, right? Here's another ready. And do you also promise not to share your password with anyone but Roger? Okay, very important to a password, no? And do you, Jennifer, promise not to interrupt the ceremony again to check your email? So people now are so focused on internet and gadgets like this one. I now pronounce you husband and wife. You may now update your Facebook status. Okay, look at this. Here's a woman married to a very old man. She plans on living happily ever after. You know. Okay, how about this? Honey, could you give me the silent treatment until about 8 30? 
and some other later. Or maybe some of our marriages now are not boring, and even during the reception, the husband is already holding the seat. But how to have a happy, healthy, and holy marriage? That's that's the thing I want us to understand. And the things that we will be learning here, coming from the Word of God, these are not uh, brand new things. I don't think there's something new under the sun as far as what the Bible is teaching. God has given us the principles. It's just a matter of using them, applying them, and remembering them. Because chances are, probably for some of us, it's been quite long that we made those vows and probably we have forgotten them. So today, okay, I want Mary Coco to, you know, look at each other right now. I want you to look at your spouse and give that spouse a romantic look. Okay. And then say something like, just wait till the end of this service. Now I want to give you the three R's of the Spirit-filled marriage. The three R's of the Spirit-filled marriage. And this is for everyone. Whether you are celebrating your dining on anniversary, or you are simply celebrating your monthly, I believe we all need the Word of God. Amen? We all need to rekindle the fire again and again, even if we do this every year. So the first lesson that we can learn from the reading in Ephesians chapter 5 is that the spirit-filled marriage reveres, is revering. That's what we find in verse 21. It reveres Christ as, as its designer and builder. That's very simple. For us to stay a spirit-filled, you know, married couple, we have to have that reverence for Jesus Christ as the designer and the builder of the whole. Look at Ephesians 5 21. When Paul started talking about the marriage life, just after the verse when he says you must be you must be filled with the spirit, he went on to say, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Meaning to say the respect, the relationship, the harmony of a couple emanates from that reverence for Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, what is Jesus' view of marriage after all? Because if you look at our society today, marriages today somehow is so casual. You can be married to a person instantly, and after a few months, if you don't like the person snoring, if you don't like the smell of the person, if there are some inconvenience, if you find and you know you don't want to fight, you can simply go go for you know annulment, you know, for a divorce or for legal separation. Somehow, marriage today is on a take it or leave it attitude. And brethren, as Christians, as a Bible believing church, we have to defend the biblical view of marriage. Because slowly the enemy is already infiltrating churches today. And uh, as I have said last week, somebody gave me a, a doctrinal statement towards LGBT of a big denomination, particularly where we came from, how they view LGBT, and it seems that in that statement, if you want a copy of that, I can email you, it seems that the church is somehow open to it. And they are accepting it, and in the statement, there is no mention of all the sins connected to homosexuality, Muslimism, and all those things. And we have to be careful, because in the view of love and grace, we might be, what? Disregarding the commands of God to live holy lives. So what I'm saying is this, marriages today is considered, what? Legal for those 
men to men, women to women. And what God forbids, what God says is unlawful, societies and governments today is making it legal, calling it respect and rights of people. So what has happened to the standards of God? In other words, we have to have that biblical view of marriage in order for society to work. Because I tell you, with the rise of all these rights and movements in our society, slowly our culture is collapsing. Soon we can accept anything. Soon we can say, well, it's my right to kill my wife. And so it will be legalized. So what is Jesus' view of marriage? When, when he was asked by a fact from the Pharisees, like, is it lawful for, for a man to, to divorce his wife for any reason? And this is how Jesus Christ answered. Jesus pointed back to Genesis chapter 2. Haven't you read the reply that at the beginning, the Creator made them what? Male and female. And said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God is joined together, let no man separate. Now, with the legalization of same-sex marriage, books, you know, law books have to change their wordings because they have to get rid of the male and female. Otherwise, they will offend. That's the reason we are changing the law of God. Therefore, what God is joined together, let no man separate. Now, we need to understand that the disciples, I want you to go to verse 10. Okay, I want you to go to verse 10. We are reading Matthew 19 here. Now, imagine when Jesus said this, this is the reaction of the disciples in verse 10. Okay. If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, what did the disciples say? It is better not to marry. In other words, the truth that Jesus Christ viewed concerning marriage is so outstanding that even in their very conservative culture, they say it's so hard. And yet our culture today is watering down marriage. The point of Jesus is that when you get into the institution of marriage, you have to take it with so much seriousness because it cannot be undone. You cannot just marry someone, you know, lightly. You have to pray for it. In fact, a lot of marriages today are disintegrating simply because of things they ought to do, but they did not do. They should have prayed for it. They should have consulted mature people over it. And what can we learn from Jesus' view of marriage? Now, we need again, in order for marriage to work, Jesus has to be the builder and the designer. How did God design marriage in the first place? There are four pieces of Jesus' view of marriage. Number one, the producer of marriage is God, the creator made them. Very clear. God must be the producer. God must be the creator. In other words, if you marry someone, it should not come from just your own feelings, but you should have a confirmation that this is from God. The reason why a lot of marriages today don't work because it was only their own production. Maybe because they were just attracted to each other, or maybe pure practical reason, I need to marry this guy because he's stable. Well, no one is so stable except God. Amen? God has to be the builder. God has to be the producer of marriage. Number two, the participants of marriage. It's very important. He made them male and female. No man can change that. And so, as far as God's word is concerned, marriage is a bond. It's a legal institution only for male and female. The church nor society 
can never solidize nor call you know the relationship of a man and a man and a woman and a woman to be married. Call it whatever, never call it marriage because it is a sacred word. Marriage is a sacred word in the Bible. Now for us to belittle it by destroying its participants is sacrilegious. It's a sin. Number three, the principle of marriage is very clear, stated by Jesus. Again, Jesus is quoting here Genesis chapter 2, verse what? 23 and 24. A man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So the principle of marriage is always leaving and cleaving. You know? You exit your family so that you can start your own family. That's how God designed marriage. And we need to understand, brethren, that in Genesis chapter 2, it was God who decided about marriage. Look, if you will, Genesis 2, 18, God says it is not good for man to be alone. It starts with a decision. And then in verse 21 and 22, God made, or God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And then from when, when Adam was sleeping, God made the woman. So it was not God who decided marriage. It was God who was doing it. And then in this verse, God makes the design leaving and cleaving it is starting a new home it is starting a new home that's the principle of marriage and number four the permanence of marriage okay it's very clear with the word used there the word clean or the word united together the word there in, in hebrew is dabak dabak the Greek word is kolao, and they both have the same meaning. The meaning of this is two, you know, two things being glued together permanently. That's the meaning of joined together with his wife. And so Jesus Christ reinforces that word by adding this in Matthew chapter 19, when it says, Therefore, what God is joined together, let no man separate. See? So marriage is supposed to be a permanent legal institution. That is why for us Christians, especially those of you who are considering marriage, it's better to stay single for long and really think and really pray that marry too soon and then suffer and be miserable. Besides, Going through a divorce or legal separation or annulment is too what? Expensive. That's why a lot of celebrities can do that because they have the money. They have the blessing from the court but not from God. So in order for us, for those of you who are still single, to avoid such miseries, let us make God the builder. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. My dear friends, are we submitting to Christ as the builder and designer of our home? If you look at your, your marriage life today, and probably you can see a lot of, you know, uh, you go back to the architect. You go back to the blueprint. Maybe you have not followed the instructions of the architect himself. Amen. Make God the builder. So, first, the spirit of marriage reveres Christ as the builder. Number two, a spirit of marriage reflects reflects what? It reflects the mystery of Christ and his church. Haven't you noticed that beginning in verse 22 to verse 33, going back to Ephesians 5. Let's go back to Ephesians 5. Come on. Go to Ephesians 5. Notice that when Jesus or when Paul was teaching about the marriage life, his main illustration is what? The church. Why submit yourselves to your husband as 
the church submit to Christ. Men, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. The point is this. Marriage is so sacred. You know why? Because it is a reflection. Listen to this. It is a reflection of the relationship of Jesus and his church. Now for a society to destroy it, it's like destroying the very nature of God's covenant with his people. For society to make two men and call it marriage, two women and call it marriage, is destroying the very theology of the church. Why? Because marriage is simply a reflection of Jesus and the people that he died for. That's why we cannot change it. Now, what are some of the reflections that we need to take note here? Therefore, one, marriage ought to reflect the cross, the cross of Jesus for his church. We find that in verse 25. Look at verse 25. Husbands, love your wife just as Christ loved the church, and look at this, gave himself up for her. That's basically talking about the cross. Amen? In other words, for Jesus to show his love for the church, he has to sacrifice. He has to surrender his life. Now in marriage it's the same. For marriage to work, there has to be cross-bearing. Amen? Cross-bearing is necessary in marriage. You know why? Because we are people that needs to be redeemed. Our spouse is as sinful as we are. And if we are not willing to carry their sins, their weaknesses, then marriage will work. Marriage is all about cross-bearing. So never say, Pastor, you cannot be like well, in the first place, why do you enter marriage? There's cross-bearing. For Jesus to show his love to the church, he has to be nailed on the cross. He has to surrender some rights. The same thing for our marriage to work. Sometimes there are personal rights, personal entitlements that I need to surrender in order for my wife to be happy. And vice versa. Cross-bearing, surrendering of rights. Sometimes, you know, for men, there are special games that you, you want me to watch and you don't want to visit. But your wife needs you, that's when cross-bearing comes in. Are you willing to surrender and give that up? Because that's what the word says. Gave up himself. Question, husband, what are some of the things that are we, the way we are willing to give up for our lives? Or have we given up something? Sometimes we are double centers. We want the spouse to give up so many things for us that we are not willing. What are you willing to give up? That's cross bearing. You see, God allows sometimes in marriage in order for us, you know, in order for us to bear the cross of Christ. And once, you know, what's the result of the cross bearing of Christ? Salvation of man. Amen? Salvation. Number two, marriage ought to reflect the cleansing, not just the cross bearing, the cleansing of Christ for his church. Look at verse 26. 27, to make her holy, cleansing her, literally means sanctifying her by washing with water through the word. All right? What's the purpose? To present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, let, let me go back to that portion. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Why it is good for husband and wife to, you know, take a bath together, you know, nice and say, huh? Are you still doing that, husband and wife? Huh? You know, ikaw na po, na po na po yun, ang kansi po, basta kanya po kulit. Right? Well, that's romantic because it's biblical, cleansing by water, but then they know the spiritual side through the word. In other words, Christian marriage, you know, 
needs to what, teach and correct you know, each other. This is discipleship. Okay? This is discipleship. We need to cleanse each other. And it is the responsibility of the husband. Husbands, are you listening? To be the main disciple in the home. Okay, I know our wives, they are imperfect. There, there are so many things that we need to, you know, polish. There are so, so many crude and rough edges in their lives. And you need to understand that you yourself have those things as well. That is why we need to use the word of God. Question, husband and wives, are we having devotions? Are we listening to the word of God? Are we sharing God's word with each other? Why? Because that's how the marriage can be cleansed. Through the word. So in, in, in marriage, it's not you trying to change the other person. You cannot do that. If your intention, if, if you think that, you know, uh, I'm sure when we are together, those things can be removed. No. When we join together in the matrimony of marriage, we don't try to change each other. Only God can change through His Word. Cleansing. Number three, marriage ought to reflect the care. Take note of that, the care of Christ for His church. We find it in verse 28 to 30. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Okay, he who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever eats his own body, but he what? Look at this, the focus here. But they feed and care for their body. That word there. In the old translation, to nourish and to cherish. Those are the words. To feed and to care, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. So to, to, to nourish simply is to bring the maturity. Husbands, what are the things that we are doing in order for us to help our wives mature? Mature in their faith, mature in their beauty, mature in their health. You know, include the beauty. Because some some wives are still in in their beauty. They need some improvements. Right? To so mature. To bring to maturity. That's the true meaning. So there's really the, the essence there of care. Then there is another one. Cherish. Okay? The word is to soften with heat. That's the literal meaning of that word. A godly husband helps his wife to reach her potentials. Husbands, are you doing that? Or are you too afraid? Yeah, malabuan ka. You see, that's, that's what Christ is doing. Christ is giving us grace to give so that the church can reach her full potential. And the same way, to cherish means to treat with affection and tenderness. I know, I know that all husbands are that romantic. I know a lot of husbands, that includes me, who are what? Not verbal. Not verbal in our affection. But we must correct ourselves. The Bible says, you have to cherish your wives. Okay? Even if they, okay, they say, also, my wife don't deserve to be changed. Wherefore, the word of God said, Amen? If we are to submit to the Lord, and if we are going to be happy till we die, then we have to follow the words of God. Amen? In 1 Corinthians 7, 3, write it down. Let the husband render to his wife the affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Affection, cherishing each other, you know. Can we do that? No. And that includes, of course, being romantic. Okay? So, I am not going to be a romantic or vice versa. It doesn't, okay, the Bible never says that romance should end when you reach 50 or 60. Okay? Be romantic. Right? Even if no more teeth, no more hair. 
be romantic. That's how we show our care. Okay, just like this couple. Okay? Caring so much. All right, number four, marriage ought to reflect the covenant commitment of Christ to his church. This is, I think this is the crux of this passage. Marriage ought to reflect the covenant of commitment. Okay? Look at this. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and his church. What, what Paul is saying here is this. For Paul to say that the man and the woman be joined together, you know, in marriage is a mystery. Okay? This means that in marriage is not just about emotion, it's not just about uh, feelings of love, because soon those emotions, affections, and tenderness will be what? Will evaporate. Okay? For some, it's just 10 years and then no more. But it doesn't mean that no more marriage. Why? Because what God wants us to see in marriage is this. It's perpetuity. It's permanence. Why? Because it is based on a commitment. It is based on a commitment. Why? Because Christ will never leave his ground. Jesus will never find another bride. Jesus will never abandon another bride. Why am I saying this? Because to the husband, our love, our commitment to our wives is the same as the love of Christ in the church. That is why it is not just sin, it is abomination for people, for the government, listen to this, to sodomize the same-sex marriage. You know why? Because it destroys the very covenant of God and His church. Staying married, therefore, is not just about staying in love. Because staying in love is human. You don't find a phrase in the Bible, you know, that you stick to your wife or you stick to your husband because you're in love. Because I tell you, you know, we have to remove hypocrisy here. We all know that the 13th love is no longer there. But that doesn't mean that marriage is no longer there. Why? Because in marriage, it's not about being in love. Go back to Genesis 2. If there's a mention of love in Genesis 2, there's no mention of love. In fact, the song, you know, Perfect Love, 1 Corinthians 13, we always connect it to marriage. But a good scholar of the Bible says it's a bad preaching to use it. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 13 is never in the context of marriage. It's, it's sandwiched, what, between Corinthians 12, which talks about spiritual gifts, and Corinthians 14, which talks about prophesying and speaking in tongues. There's no marriage there. What Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 13 is this. The greatest show of a spiritual gift is when you do it out of love. That's the essence. But in marriage, it's not about having that feeling in love. No, what is it? It's about keeping a covenant of love. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. Even if your wife is no longer that beautiful, even if your husband is no longer that handsome, it's a covenant that you made before God that should be the very reason why we stay together. Because the covenant we made before the congregation, before God, is so sacred that God really is it in His book that as long as we both should live, we have to keep that covenant. That's why we always have that till death do us part. For as long as we both shall live. Because I tell you, in marriage, we are, we are marrying a human being. And all human beings will deteriorate. Physically, you know, emotionally, and so on. You know, you cannot bear the grumpiness of your you know, spouse, the terrible smell. But that's part of the covenant. Amen? Amen? Amen. There will always be other beautiful women in the world aside from your wife. Same with the men. 
But I tell you, it's because of that covenant. That's the essence of marriage, my dear friend. That leads us to the end. The spirit of marriage will remain. It remains faithful to the marriage covenant. What? Despite of what? Despite of storms, despite of deterioration of our spouse. No. Like, what really touched me when, when I see husband who are really, they're standing beside their wives, wives who are dying, wives who are having cancer, or wives who are already, uh, what call this, paralyzed. It's so hard to do that. You know that your wife could not reciprocate to you back. But standing, you know, until the death of your spouse, loving the spouse, even if the spouse is no longer lovable, I tell you, God is honored with that. God is so honored. Why? Because it speaks so much. It reminds God of Christ loving the church, even if the church rebels, even if the church is so sick, even if the church will overlook Christ. But Christ stands there loving us. Whenever God sees his spouse doing it for his wife or for his husband, he's so blessed, he's so touched, he sees himself. So very couple, can Jesus see himself in our relationship? You see, the relationship of Jesus and the church is not perfect. Look at us. How often do we hurt Jesus? How often do we disobey our Lord? And yet, Jesus remains the same. The same for us. We have to remain. Look at this. So I forgot my wedding vows. And then you expect me to remember a conversation we had 25 years ago. But it's not just a conversation. Okay, that's why let me leave you with three practical tips. How we can remain in that vow? Well, keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Provide visuals. You know? Have your marriage contract somewhere or your sign, your pictures. Keep yourself fresh with the covenant. Remind yourself, dear, till death to us part, dear in sickness or in hell. You know why it's so sad that some husbands are so quick to find another wife when their wives are already sick? As if they're already preparing the spare. You know? It's so sadistic. Jesus will never be honored with that. It's standing there, even if husband or yours or wife of yours don't deserve it, but it's for the covenant of God. Keep it free. No? Too many say, keep it free. In other words, you know, don't make it so heavy, but also keep it free from threats. You have to preserve it. You have to, you have to be mindful. Okay? Don't be too, don't be too confident that you know what, nothing will happen. No, I tell you, even the most, you know, most, sorry, not most faithful husband or the most faithful wife can still be tempted. He was so faithful and so innocent when she was tempted by the devil. So you have to make sure that it's free from the threats of the destruction. And of course, keep it flaming. Okay? Flame it. Put flavor to your marriage. Do something out of the ordinary. You know? One day, treat your your wife, go somewhere else, and I'll be you out. Do something, make it, keep the flame burning. Okay? Put romance to it, right? And when I say keep, put flame to it, I'm talking about the seniors already. Okay? Doesn't mean that your seniors, you know, if bastos, no, there's no bastos, see, you can marry God. You know what I mean. Amen? And with that, I hope and pray that, you know, as husband and wife, we will reveal Jesus as our builder, our designer. We will be a reflection of Jesus and the church, and let's remain faithful to the marriage covenant. And that leads us now to our, everybody's, 
wedding anniversary, right? So let us prepare our special offerings to the Lord, our prayers, our thanksgiving, because as I call out the month of the year, when your anniversary falls on it, the top, we will be talking about the trees in the Bible. You know why? Because throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, trees have been part of God's story of redemption. Many varieties of trees are cited in the Bible, and events usually are connected to trees. Like, for example, you know, it started with the tree of life. The, the boat, the ark of Noah, was made out of a gopher wood. Jesus was hanging on a tree. And then towards the end of Revelation, the tree of life providing nourishment and healing for the nation. Now, for those married in the month of January, your tree is the fig tree. Okay? This is the first we mentioned in the Bible. Remember, when Adam and Eve found themselves naked, they soon fig leaves. The fig tree is a fruit bearing tree which serves as a source of sweet food for Jews. Remember Jesus Christ one day when he was hungry, desiring food, he found a fig tree with, with only leaves, no fruit. Then he cursed it. Those of you married in January, be like a fig tree, bear much fruit in serving the Lord. Couples have the right to have public display of affection. Now, February, your tree is the almond tree. The almond tree is the first tree to sprout and the last one to lose its seed. Its flowers symbolize the cups and the crown, the seven branches of the Jewish candida crown. Its Hebrew name is Shakir, signifying watchfulness, and is given to an account of its moving forward, its blossom so early, generally in February. You know, it's when it flowers, all the leaves are gone and it becomes a very colorful tree, the almond tree. For those married in February, like the almond tree, be watchful for God. March, your tree is the center tree. The center tree was chosen for the construction of the temple of God in Jerusalem. There are several reasons why this tree was chosen. Because, you know, the, street, the wood of this tree is so hard, it will last for a long time, just like the temple of God. Those married in March, may your marriage life last as symbolized by the center tree. According to Psalms 92, verse 12 be, the righteous will grow like a center in Lebanon. April is the old tree, the magnificent old tree. This is a sturdy tree as witnessed by the use of it in the Bible. In the time of the patriarchs, Jacob took the false idols from the members of the house and buried them under an oak tree in Genesis 35, verse 4. When the land of Israel was oppressed by the Midian, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon in an oak tree in Judges chapter 6. Now, oak trees, like Sarah, symbolize endurance and longevity. April couples endure all sorts of life and make God your foundation. That's the fruit of the whole tree. Alright. Next, 
Bem. Bem, isso é a caixa free. A caixa free. A caixa mode is often mentioned in reference to objects used in the construction of the tabernacle in Exodus. Also used in the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. It was made of the Akasha tree. And why use of Akasha tree? Because there were so many Akasha tree in Israel at the time. And the wood is resistant to decay because the tree causes in the hardwood many waste substances which are preservative and making the wood so strong. Those married may make your marriage strong and be preserved. June or May. Okay? Or that's the that's, that's the flower of the cash tree. June. Your tree is the palm tree. Okay, the palm tree. According to Psalms 92 verse 12, the righteous will flourish like palm trees. It is a symbol of life. It symbolizes the abundance, the fruitfulness. It is a source of food for the Jews. And so those of you married in June, be fruitful like the palm trees. Peace. July Apples. Your tree is the olive tree. Very famous tree in the Bible. This tree became the symbol of the nation of Israel. Its berries continue to be many articles of Israeli commerce. This tree has been called an emblem of peace. Prosperity and wealth, according to Psalm 128. When the olive crop fails, it is considered to be a sign of divine wrath in Jeremiah 11. Of course, this is where we get oil, it was used for worship and for the consecration of kings and priests. Olive tree symbolizes usefulness in the work of God. July couples are you useful for the glory of God? That's the fruit of fruit of the olive tree. August, the myrtle tree. What is a myrtle tree? This is an evergreen. It's just a small tree, and the leaf is known for its fragrant essential oil. And this is really used for incense, the myrtle. In fact, in the Old Testament worship, it is one of the four sacred plants used for the Feast of Tabernacles. For its fragrance, it is used for the worship of God. All the sopples are you fragrant before God. September, the pomegranate. Three. Granada. This is a fruit bearing small tree and has a very tasty fruit. And it is full of vitamins, nutrients, and even phytochemicals for so many healthy benefits. Omega name symbolizes health and vitality. October, your tree is a tamarind tree. This is described as very graceful tree with long feathery branches, clouds loosely, and flat skin like leaves, usually flourishing in spring. With spice of beautiful fig blossoms. In Genesis 21, verse 33, Abraham is recorded as planted in Tamaris tree in Virginia. Like, like all the other trees in the Bible, 
This way is a symbol of grace. October Pocos, display your graceful life in the Lord. November, the sycamore tree. The sycamore tree is actually another species of the fig tree. The leaves are dark shape with brown apex. They are dark green above a lighter prominent below. The fruit is a large edible fig, ripening from green to yellow to red. And this tree is known for the chaos. Sycamore tree symbolizes humility and loneliness. November couples are you humble. And finally, those married in December. December couples, your tree is the fir tree, and it is used, you know, in our modern days as a what? A Christmas tree. And this is related to the pine tree, the cypress. And in Isaiah 60, verse 13, the glory of Lebanon shall come to you. The pine, the fir, and the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make I will make the place of my feet glorious before God. Fear tree symbolizes stability. Peace here. Okay, are there married in the 13th month? Your tree is the tree of life. They found in Revelation 22 verse 4. Anyway, praise God for that. May I request all the focus now to please stand. Okay, go to your respective spouse. And we will read together our renewal of vows, right? Okay, together, go. Sharon, years ago, I pledged my love and commitment to you, but it seems like only yesterday. I promise to love you, honor you, comfort you, and keep you. I pledge to be by your side to love you, honor you, and comfort you in sickness and in health, for richer and for poorer, for better or worse, for as long as we both shall live. We have had all of those things, and you have been by my side as we created a family, a home, a life together. As we grow together and our love matures, may we continue to hold on to Jesus Christ as the center of our love and life. Ever faithful to these commandments, and joyful in his service. Today, at the beginning of our as husband and wife, in the presence of God and our family and friends, I am delighted to renew my vows to you, pledging my love for you and eagerly awaiting what God may bring us. This commitment to each other and to our God sealed this covenant between us in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Father, may you bless the renewal of our vows, Lord, with words we have spoken them, but they are planted and sealed in our hearts. But without your seal of approval and blessing, Lord, they are in vain. And so I commit to you, Lord, that all this very couple, the through thick and thin, through storms and joys in life, they will continue to be faithful to each other in this holy life of matrimony. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a clap of praise. Do we now give your wife, 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 wife. Yes. Let's all stand for the closing hymn. Thank you.
Thank you.